Hello, welcome to Chapter 7, Cognition and Language. These are the objectives we'll be covering over, um, over this unit. First of all, let's talk about uh, thinking. Another word for thinking is cognition. It's mental activity that goes on in the brain when a person is processing information. Now, processing includes the act of organizing, understanding, communicating information to other people. Uh, mental images um, are mental representations that stand for objects or events that have picture-like quality. Um, Coslin, in 1978, in this study, participants were asked to push a button when they had imagined themselves moving from one place of the island to another. As you see, the graph below the picture shows um, participants took longer to complete the task when the locations on the image were farther apart. Uh, here's a little experiment on my psych lab um, looking at rotating images. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Concepts are ideas that represent a class or a category of objects, events, or activities. There's two forms of uh, concepts. There's formal concepts, which are concepts that are defined by specific rules or features. There are natural concepts, which are concepts that form as a result of their experiences in the real world. For instance, uh, the concept of a platypus is a fuzzy natural concept because it's a mammal that lays eggs and has bird-like webbed feet. Um, so it, it doesn't fit our natural experience of what a mammal looks like. Uh, prototype is a concept that closely matches the defining characteristics of that concept. Prototypes develop according to the exposure a person has to objects in that category. So we compare our images that we see with our prototypes in our mind. Um, concepts are dependent on experience and culture. For instance, uh, I might have a, a concept of a tree, but my idea of a tree may differ than someone who lives in Florida who may think of a palm tree. Problem solving occurs when a goal must be reached by thinking and behaving in certain ways. Um, decision making is identifying, evaluating, and choosing between alternatives. We are bombarded with choices every day. It can be a very tiring process using a uh, a lot of our brain's resources. Um, often emotionality wins out over rationality. Um, there's something called buyer's remorse where we regret our choices that we made. Sometimes we often think too much. Trial and error is a way of solving problems. It's a mechanical solution where we, um, in which um, one possible solution after another is tried until a successful one is found. A good example is uh, my personal identification number doesn't work on my ATM. I will try another one uh, until I find the right one. Of course, that doesn't work too well because if you try it too many times, it'll cancel out your ATM or, or take your ATM away from you. Uh, an algorithm is a very specific step-by-step -step procedure for solving certain types of problems. It will always result in a correct solution if one exists to be found. For example, example uh, mathematical formulas, um, an algorithm is uh, that program that may try to find out your password by looking at every possibility. So if I have a four-digit PIN number, um, there's 10,000 possibilities. A computer will plug in all 10,000 population possibilities until it comes up with the correct answer, which wouldn't work on an ATM machine because it would cancel out your account or take your card. A heuristic um, <clears throat> method has to do with creating an educated guess based on prior experiences to help narrow down your possible solutions for a problem, also known as a rule of thumb. Uh, a representative heuristic is the assumption that any object or person sharing characteristics with members of a particular ca category is also a member of that category. For instance, uh, we have a natural tendency to generalize uh, about a group of people. Uh, for instance, if I run into someone who has red hair and I see that person with red hair has a temper, I might use a representative, representative heuristic thinking that all redheads have uh, bad tempers. Of course, that's not fair. It's a stereotype. Um, we do have a tendency to do this as humans, so we have to be careful not to stereotype, um, categorize people based on our experiences. But that's kind of a built-in part of our problem-solving 
system in our brain. Uh, availability heur heuristic is estimating the frequency or likelihood of an event based on how easy it is to recall relevant information from memory or how easy it is to think of related examples. For instance, <laughs> uh, in their, in the, they had a study where they asked people the letter K, is it used more frequently as a first or third letter of a word? And most people responded that it was the first when actually it's the third. Um, and so we, we, we tend to form uh, patterns in our brain based on our experiences. Uh, working backwards is also a goal that's a useful heuristic. Um, an example working backwards is uh, figuring out directions home. Um, where you kind of come up with a plan, um, finding the quickest way home. That's working backwards. Uh, another problem solving method is using sub goals. In other words, uh, each sub goal is achieved, the final solution becomes much closer. So it's breaking things down into steps. Insight is where we have a sudden aha moment. It's a perception of a solution to a problem. And the problem may be recognized as similar to another uh, or previous. Uh, per solve problem. For example, uh, how to remove a coin in a bottle without removing the cork or breaking the bottle. You might think, hmm, how might I do that? If I push the cork in to the bottle where it's not being removed from the bottle, I can still work the coin out of the bottle. That's an aha moment or insight. Uh, functional fixedness is a barrier to problem solving. Um, <clears throat> it's a block to problem solving that comes with thinking about objects only in terms of their typical functions. Um, let's see if I can get an example. Um, for instance, uh, um, I might use a water bottle as a flower vase. Um, and somebody might say, oh no, you can't do that because the water bottle is only used for holding water. Um, so sometimes we get in a, a certain fixed uh, form of solving problems based on uh, our functional fix, fixedness. Uh, a mental set is a tendency to, for people to persist in using problem-solving patterns that we have worked that have worked for us in the past. Um, brain teasers, for instance, force us to look beyond our mental sets. Here's a here's a brain teaser. Uh, for instance, I have six cookies on a plate. Six people took a cookie. How can there still be one cookie on the plate? Correct answer. Um, the last person took the whole plate along with the cookie. So the cookie's still on the plate. So it's helping you think outside of your current mental set. Uh, next is uh, confirmation bias. This is a tendency to search for evidence that fits, that fits one's beliefs while ignoring any evidence that does not fit. For instance, uh, when my uh, daughter comes home with a boyfriend, um, I immediately say, oh, this guy is bad. He is not good for her. And so what I'll do is my confirmation bias will continually to look for bad things um, in, in, in support that any information that might support my confirmation bias. And I might ignore anything that'll um, go against my confirmation bias. And there's a little concept map on how people will think. If you open up the... Um, the PowerPoint, you can open that link and, and, and kind of review about how people think. There's another way people can go beyond their mental set. Um, here's a guy with a string, and there's another string to his left, your right, and um, he can't reach the string on, the, on his left. But there's also a table and a player is there. Um, how do you tie the two strings together if you cannot reach them both at the same time? Um, here shows how the guy either grabs a string at a higher point um, or he, with the use of table, or he could use the pliers to extend his reach and bring it in. So aha moments are where we use the pliers or use the table um, to grab the second string higher up. Here's another one. Um, can you draw four straight lines so they pass through all nine dots without lifting your pencil from the page and without touching any dot more than once? And as if you notice, as you go through this, it's not possible um, without lifting your page or without having more than four straight lines. One, two, three, four. Um, unless you go 
outside the lines. So here is I'm thinking beyond my mental set to come up with the solution. So the solution involves moving beyond barriers and beyond current mental sets. Creativity is the process of solving problems by combining ideas or behaviors in new ways. There's a little survey on cre creativity. Uh, cre convergent thinking is a form of creativity. It's a problem as seen as having only one answer. All lines of thinking will eventually lead to or converge on a single answer using previous knowledge and logic. And that's from Ciardello in 1998. Divergent thinking, on the other hand, is where a person starts from one point and comes up with many different ideas or possibilities based on that point. Uh, and that's a type of creativity. Um, it's from Fink, 1995. Um, divergent thinking is not only um, attributed to creativity, but it's also intelligence. That's from Guilford, 1967. You saw the movie Divergent. That was a personality that was different. Well, divergent is, is having many possibilities. And that's why um, in the movie they saw the people as a, a challenge or a threat because they're creative. <clears throat> Here are some um, ways to be a more divergent thinker. There's uh, brainstorming, where you think of as many possi possibilities as possible without judging anyone's uh, um, input. So you just come up with as many ideas as possible and not discount any up front. Keeping a journal is a way to stimulate divergent thinking. Write down ideas to recapture those same ideas and thoughts. Free writing. Uh, I also call this hot penning, where you're writing down or recording anything that comes to mind about a topic without re revising or proofreading all of the information that's written. Um, mind or subject mapping. This is where you start with a central idea and draw a map with lines from the center to other related areas, forming a visual representation of the concepts or other connections. Intelligence is the ability to learn from one's experiences, acquire knowledge, and use resources effectively in adapting to new situations or solving problems. Think about what does it mean to be smart? Is it the same as being intelligent? The answer depends on immediate task or concept. You've also seen, read the book uh, City Mouse, Country Mouse, where the city mouse was, you know, had a lot of street smarts, but did not know how to function in the country. Where the country mouse had a lot of country smarts, but did not know how to function in the city. So it depends on the context um, and how you function in your environment. There's a little survey on what intelligence is. You can look that up on your uh, um, PowerPoint. Uh, a theory of one theory of intelligence is Spearman's theory. He talks about the G factor, the general intelligence factor. That's the ability to reason and solve problems, general intelligence. The S factor has to do with specific intelligence, and that's the ability to excel in certain areas. For instance, I might have task-specific abilities in music, business, or art. Intelligence cannot be defined so simply, and thus, um, Gardner proposed what's called multiple intelligence in 1988. Um, multiple intelligence, there's uh, nine of them, and it basically lists um, other ways a person could be intelligent, not only um, with general intelligence, but verbal linguistic, or the ability to use language, musical, which is to compose or perform music, logical mathematical intelligence, to think logically about mathematical projects, Problems, uh, visual spatial intelligence, the ability to understand how objects are oriented in space. And over here are some occupations that go well with this, these types of intelligence. Uh, movement intelligence, that would be your athletes. Interpersonal intelligence has to do with connecting with other people. Okay, sensitivity to others. Um, and then, it, so psychologists would make good, use your strong and in interpersonal intelligence. Intrapersonal is understanding your own emotions and how they guide your actions. Uh, and then naturalist is the ability to recognize patterns found in nature. And an existential intelligence has to do with being um, ability to see the big picture. According to Gardner, what kind of intelligence is being shown here? Notice uh, there's Michael Jordan. There's a kid golfing. Okay. Um, 
the ability to understand your body is um, the intelligence called movement intelligence. According to Gardner, what kind of intelligence is being shown here? Albert Einstein, most people think of what's called logical mathematical intelligence. What kind of intelligence is being shown here? Um, this would be visual spatial intelligence. According to Gardner, what kind of intelligence is being shown here? This would be musical intelligence. There's a little video on explaining uh, multiple intelligence here you can watch. Uh, theories of intelligence, Sternberg's triarchic theory of intelligence posits that there's three types of intelligences. This is called the triarchic theory of intelligence. First of all, analytical intelligence is the ability to break problems down into components, parts. Um, analysis is for um, problem solving. Creative intelligence is the ability to deal with new and different concepts and to come up with new ways of solving problems. Practical intelligence is the ability to use information to get along in life and become successful. This is often not referred to as street smarts. Uh, you've, um, Alfred Bernay uh, came up with what's called the intelligence quotient. This is a number representing a uh, measure of intelligence. It results from a division of one's mental age by one's chronological age and then multiplied by uh, 100. Now the Stanford Binet intelligence test um, yields what's called an IQ score. Uh, it allows testers to compare intelligence levels of people from different age groups. Um, and there's a little video on the IQ test. Uh, what's kind of interesting is uh, Stanford Binet um, came up with this um, this intelligence scale, um, but, or oh, and Binet did, but uh, Stanford is who he worked for, so that's why it's called the Stanford Binet. And from that, um, Stanford developed what's called the IQ test. Now, today's intelligence tests are norm referenced with other students of similar age to come up with what's called a percentile rank. Um, this basically uh, shows different items from an IQ test. A child can place correct shape into a matching hole on a board. A child can build a simple bridge out of blocks after being shown a model. These are age-appropriate activities to measure a kid's intelligence. Now, um, unlike the IQ, which is only used for children, uh, David Wessler devised a series of tests for different age groups. The WAIS for adult intelligence, the WISC for children, and the WPPSI for preschool age students. This is an example of uh, one of Wessler's tests um, from the WAIS, which is an adult intelligence scale. And these were some of the questions. Like, in what ways are a circle and triangle alike? In what ways are a saw and hammer alike? Um, so it would be verbal comprehension index. Um, similarities, vocabulary, information. But these would be things that would be tested. Uh, when you talk about tests, you always want to remember that all tests are not equally good tests. Two things we always look at, look at on tests are reliability which is the tendency of a test to produce the same scores over and over again each time it's given to the same people. So if I take an IQ test um, and I take it again, those tests should be pretty similar if, even after I take it over a second time. Validity is, is the test actually measuring what it's supposed to measure? In other words, is it really measuring um, stages of IQ? Um, is a person with a higher IQ um, actually have higher intelligence than someone with the lower IQ, and that's validity. Standardization is a process of giving a test to a large group of people um, under the same conditions. That represents a kind, the kind of people for whom the test is designated. Um, from that, we form what's called norms, or scores from the standardized groups. Um, so basically, when you compare your scores to other people, you get what's called a percentile rank which is not like, it's not the same as percent. Percent means what percent of the test was correct. Percentile means this score, if I scored a 80 percentile, that means in a room of 100 kids my age, I did better than 80 of them. My performance was better than 80. Um, most intelligence tests show a, a normal curve. Here's a little 
example what's called a, a normal curve or a, a bell curve. Um, and if you notice here, the zero is the, is the, the median, okay? And um, this is what's called one standard deviation. So 34% of the respondents land in this area, and then 34% land in this standard deviation. So a majority of students score within these two um, standard deviations. Now deviation IQ scores is a measure of intelligence. It assumes that IQ is normally distributed around a mean of 100 with a standard deviation about 15. Now if you have an IQ of 130, that's two standard deviations above the mean. If I have an IQ of 70, that's two standard deviations below the mean, which would put me as um, as having an intellectual disability. Now, uh, criticisms of these type of tests is what's called culture bias. Um, your book talks about culture-free tests that is able to test intelligence without um, distinguish or without disadvantaging someone because of their culture. Uh, there's a website called fairtest.org which critiques cultural bias based on tests, saying that it discriminates based on on um, race, based on gender, based on social economics, um, that it's not a, a fair indicator of um, a person's ability. Um, the usefulness of IQ tests is they're generally valid for predicting academic success, also giftedness or disabilities. Um, they also pre uh, predict success on um, job performance. However, if you look at fairtest.org, it doesn't necessarily predict success in college because a person could have a high IQ but not have the motivation to do the work, show up to class, or uh, doesn't have the self-control to not party every night. Um, neuropsychology is where you have head injuries, learning disabilities, neuropsychological disorders um, that can affect one's learning. Intellectual disability is an intellectual developmental disorder where a person exhibits deficits in mental ability and adaptive behavior. That's where a stu uh, student's IQ falls below 70 or more than um, two or more um, standard deviations from the norm. Adaptive behavior is severely deficient for a person of a particular chronological age. It's formally known as mental retardation. That's a term that's not used anymore. Um, they may use a uh, mild mentally handicapped. Um, they also use terms like other health impairment to refer to uh, um, where, a, uh, let's say, ADHD or something like that is getting in the way of a person's uh, intellectual um, learning ability. Then there's what's called learning disability, or LD. Um, and that could be in specific areas like speech, reading, writing, math. Um, then there's what's called emotional disturbance or behavior disability. Um, those are other types of disabilities. We'll go over in future chapters. Next is uh, intellectual disability can vary from mild to profound. So there's a range. So there's usually, but basically it usually measures the scoring two standard deviations below the mean in IQ tests. What are the causes of developmental delay? Um, usually it's deprived environments, as well as chromosome and gen genetic disorders. Um, alcohol can cause what's called the fetal alcohol syndrome, develop, where the developing em embryo is exposed to alcohol. There's what's called the fragile X syndrome, where the gene is passed, passed on to a child, uh, which could lead to intellectual disabilities. There's dietary deficiencies and toxins in the environment. You've heard of uh, lead exposure at an early age that can lead to um, some developmental delay. So a portion of it could be genetic, a portion could be environment, a portion could be um, another one that would be, would, which is not mentioned here is uh, childhood trauma um, could cause a, a developmental, developmental delay as well. Let's talk about uh, gifted students. Um, this would be 2% of the population who fall in the upper end of the normal curve, and they're typically possessing an IQ of 130 or above. Um, does giftedness guarantee success? Lewis Terman, in 1947, he had a, a group of people he called his uh, termites, and 
these were his gifted students. He studied gifted students. Um, he found that they were more resistant to mental illness. They were average in height, weight, and attractiveness, but uh, earned more advanced degrees compared to their counterparts. However, being gifted does not necessarily lead to success in life. Um, his oops, his uh, study, he's been criticized for lack of objectivity because he became too involved with the lives of his termites, even to the point of interfering on their behalf. Um, it's interesting because he's, you know, dealing with the life of uh, children and he should want to, you know, want them to do well. But that intervention would not make the test very objective. Uh, emotional intelligence um, includes empathy, the ability to feel what other people are feeling, uh, the ability to interpret facial expression, body language, and gestures. Um, it's being able to manage your own emotions, as well as the ability to be self-motivated, to feel what others feel, and to be socially skilled. Meyer and Slobovi in 1997. Um, it's viewed as a powerful influence on success in life. Uh, that's from Goldman, 1995. Here are some concept maps on intelligence that you can do to review the chapter a little more. Okay, um, there's some stronger correlations found between IQ scores as genetic related increases. Um, Plowman, 1998, said heredit hereditability of IQ is estimated at 0.5. So there's a 50% chance that IQ is passed on to your children. The Flynn effect says IQ scores are steadily increasing over time in modernized cultures. Uh, Flynn, in 2009, found that um, as cultures become more modernized, the IQ score goes up. Um, usually because education improves in more modernized countries. So it's not as much genetic, it's more nurturing. The Bell Curve um, was a book that was made widely um, criticized, claims that intelligence is inherited. Um, and this lead, led to what's called a stereotype threat. Um, Hernstein and Murray in 1994, their book, The Bell Curve, cites large numbers of statistical studies that lead them to claim that IQ is largely inherited. However, they made several statistical errors and ignored effects of both environment and culture on intelligence. They implied that people from lower economic levels are poor because they're unintelligent. However, here's a little uh, study that goes against this. Um, Correlations between IQ scores. Um, if you notice nature's influence, uh, heritability is 50%, yet it's identical for, uh, yet for identical twins it's 86%. But they're saying it's higher due to similar environment because identical twins grow up in the same nurturing environment. Where nature's influence, note the subjects in the same environment, even identical twins, it increases the similarity considerably. So when um, when they're together, they tend to have a lot similar um, progress. Let's talk about language. A system, it's a sim system for combining symbols, such as words, so that an unlimited number of meaningful statements can be made for the purpose of communicating with others. Uh, Part of language involves grammar, which is a system of rules, and then there's phonemes, which is basic units of the sound of language. Uh, for instance, the word playing in, consists of two morphemes, play plus ing. Uh, let's see. And then morphemes is the smallest unit of meaning within a language. Syntax is a system of rules for combining words and phrases to form grammatically correct sentences. An example of syntax is John the kidnapped boy is different from John kidnapped the boy. Same four words but of different meanings and humans are able to understand the syntax between the two where animals uh, are unable to you know distinguish that. Semantics is the rules for determining the meaning of words and sentences. For instance the meaning of word deer, wild beast, same, it means the same but it's but it has different nuances, um, or the words last stop and destination. Uh, they mean the same, but they have subtle shades of meaning. 
Pragmatics are aspects of language involving practical ways of communicating with each other uh, or the social niceties of language. For instance, uh, consider your intonation when you're talking with a child. Oh, you look so cute. Compare that with how you talk to an adult. Um, that would be, include pragmatics. Uh, linguistic relativity has hypothesis. This is a theory um, based on what's called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And basically it says that um, thought processes and concepts are controlled by language. Um, language influences our thoughts. Our words are used to think about the world around us. Uh, for instance, um, Sapir-Whorf hypothesis came from um, their study of uh, Native American language, and they found that um, the, the Hopi tribe um, did not have um, future tense in their language, and so it shaped their way of, of their reality. Um, also think about, you know, terminology, old terminology we used to use, like the word invalid for somebody who was unable to care for themselves. It's basically spelled the same as invalid. It's not a very nice word, is it? Or one of um, or our re references to Native Americans as savages, uh, implying that they're less than human. Um, words do matter because they affect our worldview. Uh, a good book to read that you that I encourage you to read is uh, 1983 by George Orwell, where it talks about um, how the government was trying to control the words. <laughs> Um, that the people use um, to keep them from thinking a certain way. So it's trying to control the population by controlling the words. Um, they talk about thought crime and stuff like that. It's a pretty good book. Um, or you can see it on Netflix. Um, cognitive universalism. Um, this is uh, the op an opposite view where some people say it's our thoughts that influence our, lang influence our language, not our language influence our thoughts. Uh, so Davies had a different approach to to language. Uh, there have been some uh, animal studies trying to get animals to to do what we do to be able to communicate. And in 1973, uh, a Columbia University psychology experiment called Project NIM. Um, they were going to see if a, a chimpanzee could speak as a human if he were raised as a human. Uh, think about this. A chimpanzee has like 98% of the same DNA as we do. So he said, let's just raise a chimpanzee as a human being, and therefore it will act like a human being. Um, <laughs> what they found out is the chimpanzee learned about 125 uh, American Sign Language signs um, and was able to communicate, but not quite in formal sentences. Um, in 1977, um, five years later, the experiment ended when uh, Nim uh, attacked his caretaker. Um, actually, they, they named the, the, the chimpanzee Nim Chimsky uh, to make fun of uh, Noam Chimsky, which, who was a linguist and talked about uh, in how a lot of language is innate. Um, and they wanted to prove him wrong by showing that they could teach a chimpanzee to speak. Um, obviously, the chimpanzee didn't have the structures in his brain to, to handle the syntax of language. Um, what's kind of sad about this is 1977, um, the experiment ended when he attacked his caretaker. He, was, he went from being treated like a human to being moved into a cage in a research facility. Um, needless to say, he became really, really depressed um, until he was rescued and put in an animal sanctuary. Um, he lived to about 2000. So, but he, he died free. Uh, controversy exists over lack of evidence that animals can learn in syntax, which mean which some feel means that animals are not truly learning and using language. So, um, actually, the chimpanzee was uh, advanced compared to humans for that first year. But when it came to developing language and the structures, for, cognitive structures for um, for communicating. That's where uh, humans surpass, surpass the chimpanzee. Um, finally, mental activities that require creativity and use of memory abilities can help keep the brain fit. 
In other words, you've heard the saying, use it or lose it. Um, it's important that we continue to challenge our brain um, with crossword puzzles, reading books. Um, people who do this, do this are less likely to experience symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, physical activity also improves uh, executive control and memory processes, according to Chaddock, 2010. Um, also keep in mind what's good for the heart or body is also good for the mind. This concludes our chapter. Have a great week.